Good morning, everyone. Uh, lovely to see you here. It's great that we can come together uh, this Sunday and worship God uh, as a family. Uh, if I'm a stranger to you, my name's Tim Sinclair. I'm the minister here. And please, if you can, stick around the end. We've got tea and coffee, juice and biscuits and things up at the back. Uh, and it's always good to have that time uh, together. Just to share a few things uh, coming up. Small groups are meeting this week on Tuesdays and Wednesday. Uh, the usual time and space and then after this week there'll be a, a, a break uh, for about four weeks uh, to navigate our way through Easter and holidays and other things like that and then we'll be back uh, later in the year. Uh, but while thinking about small groups um, I want to make an apology. Um, last week we were talking about the Lord's Supper uh, and I spoke about how it invites us to, to look back and to look around and to look forward and someone in one of my small groups said thank you for that three point perspective I found it very helpful it's a helpful way of thinking about it and I thought I agree because I found it very helpful when I first came across it uh, in a book that I'd been reading so last week I should have acknowledged uh, Brian Rosner who's an Australian uh, who teaches at a Bible college in Melbourne uh, who wrote very helpfully about the Lord's Supper and I'm sorry I should have credited him uh, last week but I hope better late uh, than never and then looking ahead, we've got our coffee morning as usual on Friday from half 10 till 12. Uh, welcome to drop in uh, church and community coming together. And then looking ahead to the 23rd of May, we've got our Easter fun day. And we now have flyers printed off, look like this, double-sided to give you all the information that you need. And the encouragement is to take a flyer and to invite uh, friends, neighbours, uh, grandchildren, uh, usually a personal invite is the most effective way of encouraging people to come along and be part of something like this. But experience has shown that whoever turns up, whether they're from our church, another church, no church at all, that they have a, a great time doing all the different activities uh, that are on offer. And so there are, as well as leaflets like this, there are also posters and it might be that you can think of somewhere uh, in your community, in your weekly life, where um, you could display a poster. And if this is the first that you've heard about our Easter fun day, uh, 23rd of May, 10 till 12. For, what did I just say? May. It's March. Right, yes, 23rd of March. We want to get the right, right month. The correct <laughs> month is printed on the sheet. Uh, and so, yeah, a week on from Easter rather than two months after Easter, we're having our Easter fun day. So an encouragement to come, invite and pray for our Easter fun day. And Alan, uh, who's sitting just in front of the sound desk there, is still uh, happy to welcome any offers of help on the day itself, but also in the days leading up to it, where there's all, a lot of set up to completely transform this space into a place that will uh, work for our fun day. So I'll leave that with you. And before I can get anything else wrong, let's just have a moment of quiet, and then we'll uh, hear God's words calling us to worship as I read the words of Psalm 93 and then I'll pray and then we'll stand and sing our first song together Psalm 93 The Lord reigns he is robed in majesty the Lord is robed in majesty and armed with strength indeed the world is established firm and secure your throne was established long ago you are from all eternity the seas have lifted up, Lord. The seas have lifted up their voice. The seas have lifted up their pounding waves, mightier than the thunder of the great waters, mightier than the breakers of the sea. The Lord on high is mighty. Your statutes, Lord, stand firm. Holiness adorns your house for endless days. God of all time and all glory, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we ask that you would inspire our praise, that you would receive our praise to your glory now and forever. Amen. So let's stand as we sing together, all creatures of our God and King. Oh, praise Him. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
you are life, wisdom, and truth, the eternal, the only true good. You are our hope. You are our heart's joy. And we acknowledge with thanksgiving that you have made each one of us in your image, and that you invite us to direct our thoughts and prayers to you. We ask this morning that you would help us to know you better so that we might love and enjoy you more and more through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Help us to see what he has done for us and in our place. Help us to find and recognize our identity in him and as part of a family. Help us to face whatever's coming next, holding firmly to the hope that we have in him. And it is at his invitation that we come to you just as we are, carrying with us the unanswered questions and worries of the week gone by, uncertain about what's best, what's right, what you might ask of us unclear as to why each new cycle brings more conflict, more reports of injustice. Unhappy, perhaps, as we sense our weakness and failures, and unsettled as we see the suffering of others, health problems, financial worries, relationship problems, 
But at each of these points, your invitation remains. You invite us to come to you. You invite us to trust you. You promise to hear our prayers. And by the Holy Spirit, to join them in praying with us, in praying for us, advocating for us. Lord, answer when we call. I ask that each one of us would know the encouragement that comes in being brought together like this by your grace. And we ask that you would hear us today as we bring our voices together to say with one voice the words that Jesus has given to us, saying, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And we continue our worship as we sing once more. Let's stand and sing from the breaking of the dawn.
since early January, we've been working our way through this series about being human uh, in an age of confusion. And we're very close to the, the finishing line of that uh, just now. And so happens just this morning, walking to church, I was listening uh, to music. Um, and the words of one of the songs uh, by one of my favorite songwriters, Sufjan Stevens, uh, kind of jumped out at me as capturing something of the atmosphere uh, that's underlied this series and will be present uh, as we explore our reading uh, later this morning. Uh, in, a, in a sad little song called The Upper Peninsula, there's a little refrain that goes, in strange ideas, in stranger times, I've no idea what's right sometimes. And as our last song just sung, in the midst of that um, uncertainty, we want to take a stand uh, on God's word. But first we have to hear what it has to say to us. And so we're going to read from Genesis chapter 3. Ailey's going to come and read the passage for us. There should be a red Bible uh, under a chair close by, and I would encourage you to follow along. And at the very end of the reading, we'll immediately then stand and sing our next song, which is called Enough. Thanks, Ailey. Pretend I'm tall. Genesis 3, starting at verse 8. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree from which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, the snake deceived me and I ate. So the Lord God said to the snake, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. To the woman he said, I will make your pains in childbirth very severe. With painful labour you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. To Adam he said, because you listened to your wife and ate fruit from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat from it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat food from it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. Adam named his wife Eve, because she would become the mother of all the living. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. And the Lord God said, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life.
We're going to take uh, quite a close look at not the entirety of the reading that Ailey read to us this morning, but verses 14 to 24, and I think you will find it helpful to be able to see that passage in front of you as we do that. But let me first uh, pray once more. God, our Father, we ask that you would bring a real clarity uh, to our confusion, that we would grow in our confidence that what you have to say to us is trustworthy and good, and that you'd help us to respond uh, in the whole of our lives, in how we relate to you, how we relate to one another, in the things that we make important. And so we pray that you would be present among us and speak to us. And we pray also for your presence with uh, friends, people in this church family who aren't able to be with us today, especially those who are struggling in the midst of uh, health challenges, physical, mental, family difficulties, all the things that life can uh, throw our way. We pray also for our children and we give thanks for them, for their unique personalities, for their energy, for their smiles. And we ask that just now as they meet in their own groups, through in Crash and in Blast, uh, that they would just enjoy that time and the relationships they find there and enjoy learning something or learning more about who you are and the difference that that makes. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So looking back a few weeks ago, so when we were reading from Genesis 2, we had an almost dreamlike vision of the Garden of Eden where everything was good in the sight of God, where for humanity there was meaningful work to do, there was uh, mutual uh, recognition, companionship. From that we come to Genesis 3. But what we're confronted with is really the human condition as we know it. 
where everything is different, where many things are more difficult. And the experience of um, Adam and Eve at the end of Genesis 3, as they find themselves east of Eden, is in large measure our experience. It's not a dream. It's what we wake up to each new day. And for them and for us, being human means being uh, touched, pulled in different directions by things that are good and things that are not good. It means having a body that is touched by pain, even in the very act of bringing new life. It means to be engaged in relationships that are marred and sometimes spoiled by struggle and conflict. It's to be engaged in work that exhausts us and drains us. And it is to live each day under the shadow of our mortality. This is not easy stuff. And in Genesis 3, the man and woman are confronted by God, the God whom they've already uh, turned their backs on. Already their shame has driven them to hide. And then there's the blame game that follows. And trying to blame someone else doesn't do anything to dilute uh, the initial offense and the decision that they've taken. The man blames the woman. The woman blames the snake. And in what follows, all three are held to account as the Lord God addresses each in turn. And for us, as we read, it's as if we're witnessing uh, almost the climax of a courtroom scene as the guilty are sentenced by the presiding judge, all three on the naughty step, all three facing consequences. And actually what God says to each of them in a distinct way has something to say to us and addresses our experience of life uh, outside the garden, life east of Eden. I think this, this ancient text speaks loud and clear into our situation today. And so we begin with the snake. The presence of the snake was introduced suddenly without warning in verse one of chapter three. We're told the snake was more crafty than any of the wild animals that the Lord God had made. But now the snake is singled out for a different reason. God says, because you have done this, because the snake had deceived uh, Eve deceived the woman who in turn uh, brought the man along with her. God says, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. The word cursed, the opposite of blessed, meaning provoking God's judgment rather than God's favor. You'll crawl on your belly. You'll eat dust all the days of your life. And we're not to imagine here that the snake has fundamentally changed in its anatomy or its behavior or its diet. But in seeing a snake, as the snake hugs the ground amid the dust, we're to see a picture of complete humiliation, the lowest of the low. The snake had been the mouthpiece of all that is anti-God, all that subverts and twists the father of lies, an enemy of God and of the man and woman made in God's image. And we've seen already early in the chapter that there is this uh, fateful alliance between first the snake and the woman, and then also the man. As the man and the woman, they act on what the snake says, not on what God has said. But the whole alliance was built on deceit. And now God makes clear that the alliance collapses into enmity and hostility. The woman and her offspring, all humanity, will be under constant attack from this enemy, continuing to spoil and twist this enemy who represents the power of sin and death. And we're not to underestimate the cost of that conflict. The picture we get is of a, an ongoing struggle between humanity and the enemy whom they had placed their trust. And there are days as we live in the midst of that struggle, it feels like a, a losing battle. We taste that sting of sin and death. And yet the snake is doomed to know, as God addresses them, that one day the offspring of the woman will crush his head. This moment of being battered, bruised, trampled underfoot. So even as God, in this moment of uh, exercising justice, uh, gives these little hints 
that ultimately evil will be uh, defeated. There's hope for a better future, but none of the details are obvious yet. None of the when or the how uh, or the who, none of that is in focus. And then having spoken to the snake, the Lord God then addresses the woman. I will make your pains and childbearing very severe. With painful labor, you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Now, let me assure you, it is completely accidental that we are considering these words on Mother's Day and two days on from International Women's Day. Uh, the woman, the woman had blamed the snake for deceiving her. But she is treated by God as someone who is accountable for her own actions. And the consequences that fall are no small thing. You know, pain and frustration and fear that goes with it will be part of her experience. The man and the woman had been created by God, given life by God, and called to be fruitful and increase in number. That was their their mandate, but it's now going to be accompanied by the agonies of childbirth. And we note that even with all our medical expertise, our medication, our resources, you know, pregnancy and childhood remains an ordeal, demanding, sometimes dangerous. And of course, most mothers for most of history have endured it without so much as a paracetamol. And as a side, on the day uh, our youngest was born, maybe it was Harris, um, in the rush to the hospital, I gave no thought whatsoever to what I was wearing. And it became clear that my unthinking choice of my Superman t-shirt was ill-judged because it falls on the women in those hours or sometimes days to exert that superhuman effort, uh, the cost, the demand, all that it takes. And so that's the first part of verse 16. But verse, the second part, I think, is more difficult and requires very careful reading. As God says to the woman, your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. And the overall sense, I think, here is some sort of misalignment between men and women, a, a kind of discord where there had once been harmony. We see both in God's creation, what God's made, and in what God says in God's Word, that there is a difference between male and female, even as both are made in the image and likeness of God. Both were made for God, made for a purpose, and made for one another. And yet, for them, and for many, the experience of relating to the opposite sex is not of happy union or a kind of complementary partnership where everyone wins, but of course of struggle abuse, exploitation. And there is so much confusion here. Last year, I read a book called The Need to Be Whole by the American writer Wendell Berry. Uh, and he's mainly talking about race relations in America, the history of prejudice. Um, but as he's talking about equality and the way we think and speak in the 21st century, he says this, he says, I'll assume the risk of generalization to speak of the differences between the sexes that seem to me merely obvious. One, women are physically and sexually different from men. Two, their role in procreation is immeasurably more burdening and painful and dangerous than that of men. Three, they are sexually attractive to most men, which is another danger to them because four, most women are physically smaller than most men. Now, whether you see it or would put it like that, I think like Barry, I can't pretend that I don't see difference between men and women. And we can't read Genesis 1 to 3 without seeing clear differences there too. I've touched on the, the distinctive role in childbearing the most obvious point of difference perhaps, but not the only one. There is the sense in which each one of us is to discover, you know, we're, we're sexual beings. I'm a man and I can't relate to you on any other basis than as a man, relating to you as a man or a woman. 
The picture in these verses is that the man is not the same as the woman, and the woman is not the same as the man. And yet, at no point does it undermine that sense that both were made in the image of God, both entrusted with a task to do, both regarded before God as morally responsible for their actions. Neither is less human, less significant, neither is less in need of God's grace. And what we find in this verse does not change that fundamental starting point. But we come back to our painful experiences. The sad truth that there is no end to the different ways that people have been hurt and confused in the area of sex and sexuality and relationships. So let's go back to the second, the tricky second half of verse 16. And, but we'll start at the beginning, the final words, he will rule over you. That's what God says to the woman. What does this mean? Does it mean that the woman is condemned always to have the short straw in all relations between the sexes? That there is a difference that will always be exploited, that to be the woman is always to be at the wrong end of a hierarchy in which the power and control is on the side of the man, open to misuse and abuse. And of course, whatever we take from Genesis, it's been the experience through the history of many women across many cultures of that inequality, the experiences of domestic and sexual abuse that remain appallingly common and is always wrong. But before those words, we have the first part of that sentence that in some ways seem to push in a slightly different direction as the woman is told, your desire will be for your husband. The word translated as desire means crave, it means urge, it means longing. And it describes in some way the posture of the woman towards the man, towards her husband. And I suppose most often this has been read to suggest that the woman is drawn to, uh, drawn to the, her husband despite uh, whatever imbalance there might be in terms of their power, a kind of fatal attraction, just as she desired the forbidden fruit in the, the garden. Uh, her desire for the man leads her into this situation of submission and subjugation. And there's little commentary on Genesis. The Old Testament scholar Derek Kidner writes, to love and to cherish becomes to desire and to dominate. But there's another way of reading it, which I think is actually more helpful, though maybe less obvious as you read it in our English Bibles. Rather than imagining the woman thinking about the husband saying, I desire you, and perhaps reading into that some sort of sexual overtone, is to see the same word, and it can read like this, I desire to master or control you. And we find the word desire used in this way, if we just flicked over the page to Genesis 4, where Cain, um, Cain, who is the, the son of Adam and Eve, uh, at the moment where he's tempted to act out of anger towards his brother, is warned by God, if you, so this is, I think, verse 7, let me flick over and check that. Yeah, verse 7 of Genesis 4, God says, but if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door, it desires to have you, it desires to have you, to master you, control you, but you must rule over it. And when we read it in this way, what we find in this second part of Genesis 3.16 is a statement that on the one hand, the woman desires to master their husband, paired with a statement that suggests that that will be contested by the husband. We have these two pressures working against each other, a bit like the hostility between the offspring of the snake and the woman. God is saying to the woman, there'll be no easy peace between you and the man. The relations between the sexes will be marked by this constant tug of war, tension and struggle, that there will be that competition. There will be frustration. There will be, in given instances, winners and losers. There will be a simmering discontent with always the potential to bubble over into something worse. 
And that seems to me close to the lived experience of many. Again, so much confusion, pain, and disappointment in the context of us trying, even trying our best to relate well to one another as men and women. And it all seems so, so far removed from the first encounter between the man and the woman in Genesis 2. But what was the atmosphere there? There was the moment of recognition, of delight, of relief, of not being alone, of being together, of sharing in the task, becoming one flesh, with all the, the connotations of intimacy and union and a shared identity. You know, we could go not far from here, go half a mile, go to the university library. You can read about psychology and sociology. You can learn about the, the workings of the human mind, uh, how hormones work in our body. You can read a thousand books on sex, sexuality, and gender. But it seems we cannot educate our way out of the pain and the frustration and the fear sometimes, and the potential for harm conveyed in those little phrases your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. East of Eden, we struggle to get along. We often hurt one another. And even in the community of just two, peace can be fragile and temporary. And then lastly, the Lord God speaks to the man. And the word cursed is used for a second time, not against the man, as it wasn't used against the woman, but against the ground itself. And it seems here in rejecting God and God's goodness, their distance not only from God, but actually the goodness that was there in the ground and the creation God had made. And work, that, that purposeful activity, which was always part of being human, that was I think, an aspect of what it means to be made in God's image and likeness, to, like God, um, bring order uh, out of chaos, to cultivate and enjoy the good thing God has made. Work changes into something quite different. It's going to be more like pumping air into a punctured tire. It's going to be marked by sweat, exertion, frustration, resistance, the specter of futility, two steps forward, three steps back, the possibility of failure, disappointment, and exhaustion are introduced. Nature red in tooth and claw. That's how creation will be experienced as an obstacle, as a threat, as an unrelenting, untiring uh, resistance. And right through these verses, the emphasis is not on the work as an end in itself, but as the means of growing food, food that is needed for survival. And all this, of course, the consequence of the decision, a decision that was made without much struggle, to eat what was not permitted, what was never necessary. And then in the final words, that the sense that even after a lifetime of disciplined work, even after facing and overcoming hurdle after hurdle, all that can only delay the moment when they will finally return to the ground. Having rejected the word of God, which endures forever, they will have to endure life under the shadow of death. And so, having spoken in turn to the snake, the woman, and to the man, we come to the, the closing scene and nothing in this closing scene, in a sense, dilutes the strong medicine that's been dealt out in the preceding verses. And yet I think there is just the hint of something better. First, we have the moment as Adam names his wife Eve, which means, we're told, mother of the living. So here, even in this moment of exile, even as they uh, head out under this uh, suspended sentence of death, there is this gesture that speaks of life and a future. But we say, well, this is clearly an end of something, but it is not the end. There is the anticipation of a future. And then in their shame, the man and woman had attempted to hide their nakedness. Something had changed. They couldn't carry on as before. But now it's the Lord God who clothes them as he addresses 
the problem they'd made for themselves. It's just a token of grace. They stand there in their shame. Their shame is their own. But God gives what is needed to cover them. And then they're banished from the garden. They leave. They cannot return. The tree of life is out of reach. Now, as we've seen, even before they were banished from the garden, their freedom had already, in a sense, been forfeited by what they'd done. And a barrier is put in place. The separation is confirmed. The divorce between creator and creature, it seems, is finalized. And we stand on the other side of that. And our experience of being human can be understood as the struggle, as the futile attempt to take hold of something that simply is no longer in reach. We want to know peace and fulfillment in our relationships. We want to know satisfaction, success in our work. We want to know God, to enjoy Him, to glorify Him forever. We want to escape that shadow of death and take hold of life without that constant fear of separation. And we ask, can we achieve these things? And if not, why do we long for things that we cannot take hold of? Why can we ache for something that we have never fully known? So maybe we just push down those questions. Maybe we numb our longings. We just focus on here and now, what's right in front of me. Even if sometimes when we least expect it, perhaps even in your dreams, you find yourself stretching for what you do not have and cannot reach. And in our frustration, we take hold of what we can get our hands on, which may not be good, may not be good for you. We make what we can of work and relationships we muddle through. We accumulate experiences, we accumulate stuff, but we never regain what Adam and Eve once had and then lost. We cannot get back to Eden. We cannot storm the barricades. We can't recreate it. We can't buy it. There is no higher court to which we can appeal to overturn the ruling. And so perhaps we feel like the color has disappeared and we're left nothing but distraction or despair. But I don't despair. We look at all this, we can look at it full in the face. I don't despair because what we're told is that God has sent His Son to be east of Eden with us. That all that was hinted at in Genesis 3.15 is revealed in Jesus Christ. Jesus, who as we've seen, was, was human like us. He was the offspring of a woman. Like us, He was like Adam and Eve, that experience of being stripped naked, of having nowhere to hide. The only clothing he had was offered in mockery. He was isolated with no one by his side. He was lifted up on a tree that spoke not of life, but of death and defeat. And there experienced judgment in our place, bearing our sentence. And though no one realized it at the time, there the snake, and all that the snake represents was crushed. And at the tree of his death, we find life. He bears our sin, our alienation, so that relationships might be restored. He offers himself, back to last week, this is my body, to be our food, our nourishment, all that we need. And so it's there in the meeting of that need, that longing, and His sufficiency that we find hope. We look anywhere else, and the end point is always confusion. We look to Him. We're invited to find life and truth. We're invited to find a way back or a way forward to all that was once lost east of Eden. The tree of life is out of our reach. We cannot take hold of it. We're confused, alone. But it is in that very place that Jesus would take hold of you and say, well, I am the life. I am the truth. I am the way.
He shows us what it means to be human. And with him, we can truly become human. And the paradise that was lost is made new. Let's pray. God, our Father, you know each one of us and our starting point as we think about these things. And so now in the quiet before you, we just simply take a moment to say, what do you want us to do next? What are we still missing? Where are we putting our energy And what are you inviting us into? And we thank you for your grace that disregards all that counts against us and confronts us with a love that is always on the front foot, seeking us in our lostness, and embracing us despite all the uh, baggage we bring with us. And that would clothe us in your perfect righteousness through Jesus Christ. Amen. And so if someone could give Cresh and Blast a nod to come back, that would be great. And we are going to sing once more. So let's stand as we sing together as well with my soul.
good to see you all. Big welcome to everyone's just come in, come in from Creation Blast and all your helpers. Now, I'm just going to say this now before I forget. And at the beginning, uh, when I was just talking to, to the grown-ups, I said the Easter fun day is coming up on the 23rd of May. That is wrong. <laughs> it's coming up on the 23rd of March, which is really very soon. And we've got some leaflets at the back. So if you haven't heard about this yet, you might want to take a leaflet or your mum or dad, whoever brought you to church, might want to take one. And you might want to give one to a friend or someone else, but that's coming up soon. So I just thought I would tell you about that. And if I'm telling you guys about anything, and I'm standing here at the front, I usually stand here so I can see you, and you can see me, and hopefully uh, you can hear me, and sometimes I ask you things and I can hear you. It'd be a bit funny if I stood like this, wouldn't it? If I turned my back on you. But what we read about in the Bible is it tells us that from the very beginning... Uh, people like you and like me have been turning our backs on God. God's there face to face with us and we just turn our back. And the thing is when you turn your back on someone it gets a bit harder to, well for a start you can't see them and you can't really speak just as easily. Sometimes you can't hear each other and after a while you might even wonder if they're still there at all. And that's what happens. People who couldn't turn their back on God, couldn't really see God anymore, be with God, hear or listen to God anymore, and perhaps they even wondered whether God was still there at all. And after a while, they didn't just turn their back on God, they got further and further and further away from God. Further and further and further and further and further and further and further. Now, this won't work if I just keep walking, so I'm going to come back. But what we also discover is that God cares about us. So even though we're not listening, even though we're not looking at God, even though we sometimes wonder whether God's there at all, God is always looking at us. And he never forgets us. And he loves us. And God sent his son, Jesus, to where we were, going in the wrong direction, halfway down the corridor. And Jesus himself said this, he said, I came to seek. Seeking means someone's lost or hiding. He went to get them and to save those who were lost. And that's what God does for us too. He knows we're facing the wrong way, we've turned our backs. He knows we're getting lost and wandering off. But he sends his son first to find us and then to save us. And to bring us back to where we need to be, where we're face to face with God, where we can see God, which is a good thing. And that we can hear God and that we can speak to God and know that God's there and know that God is smiling upon us. And he does all this through Jesus. And our final song today is all about looking. It's called Be Thou My Vision. It's about looking, always facing the right way, facing God in the middle of all the other things that are going on. Uh, And this song is an old song, but it's also a prayer. And it's a prayer that we would not turn our backs, but look to God each day, whether you're at nursery, school, home, holidays, work, whatever. And so let's stand and we'll sing together now. Be thou my vision. Oh, 
and established in love may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ and to know this love that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen.